Okay, we're going to get started. I'm very pleased to introduce Judith, Judith Donath. She's the second speaker in our special series, Trends in Society and Information Technology. She explores how technology affects the social world, doing this as a theorist, designer, and artist. Uh, she's currently a fellow at the Berkman Center for the Internet and Society at Harvard. She was the founder of the social media group at the MIT Media Lab. She wrote this book, I don't have enough hands, oh jeez, it's really heavy, <laughs> this book, uh, The Social Machine, Designs for Living Online, which is not only interesting but beautiful. Her work has been shown in museums and galleries and recently at the MIT Museum as a major exhibit. Uh, please join me in welcoming Judith Donath to Irvine. So, um, thank you Judy, and it's really nice being here. Um, I'm probably not going to be talking that much about design today. <laughs> so, that, was a, um, that was my last book, and a lot of what I'm talking about is work that I'm writing now, but it goes back to work that I had done um, quite a while ago. I think Gloria and I were talking this morning about how we had last seen each other in a conference in the end of the 20th century. And the work that I'm talking about today, I was just starting to think about then from the uh, perspective of design. Um, and the question of technology and deception um, was interesting then, as it continues to be. At that time, there were just starting to be a lot of online spaces where people could pretend to be anything they wanted. This is the time when Sherry Turkle, who is now talking about how important it is to have face-to-face -face conversations at that time was really into the idea that we could just reinvent ourselves and be anything we wanted online. And so some people thought this is this amazing celebration of human potential. You could be anyone. And other people were saying, this is completely dishonest. It's horrible. But the arguments didn't seem very well grounded. And I happened to be taking a course at Harvard on the evolution of communication. And that was looking a lot at birds and all different animal communications. And I, through that, became aware of a theory called signaling theory, which I'm going to give you a very brief introduction today. It would be a course in itself. So in 45 minutes, you could just get a few hints. Um, but I ended up using that as an approach. So it's very much an economic approach to understanding deception as opposed to a moral or an ethical one. Um, it's more about how does it happen and, and with the basic question saying, you know, if you can get away with it, if you can say that you are better, smarter, faster than you actually are, it's usually quite beneficial to you. But on the other hand, if all communication was dishonest, there wouldn't be any communication because there would be no reason to listen to what anyone else had to say. And so the question is what keeps given the motivations there can be to be deceptive in some way. What keeps communication honest enough to function? And so just one quick caveat before I start is that when I talk about deception here, that's partly a term from biology, but it's not necessarily a pejorative one. And so at, at some level, this moves into the realm of impression management. There are times when we don't really want to know everything that's going on in your head. You all come, you, you come to work every day, you're dressed as a reasonably respectable member of society, even though you might not feel it at that moment, but you play a role, you pretend, you do something other than express your inner thoughts. And so there's levels of this not quite truth telling that are required by society. It's not, so it's much more about these different levels of impression management versus perception than this is about the type of lie where you're telling a lie about somebody else. Um, but these sort of debates continue today. You know, there's still a lot of people, there's still a lot of concern around the fact that online deception is a lot easier than it is in the real world. You know, for instance, a tremendous amount of what we do online, and this is just one of any of a million of examples we could come up with here, um, a lot of things are based on saying, well, if I have your email address, then you can sign up for the service and you can bootstrap from that and then that's your identity here. And getting an email address is trivially cheap. On the other hand, um, in a lot of ways, online, the online world makes deception a lot harder. Um, for one, you have, most of you are on Facebook or on some other means in which, you know, if you're on email, if you're texting anyone, the types of conversations that in the face-to-face -face world are ephemeral 
online last indefinitely. For those of you who are coming into college in the era of Facebook, one of the things you missed out on is that opportunity to just come to college and reinvent yourself from scratch. You can't pick another name. You cannot really hide the nicknames you were known by in high school or, all, or the pictures of yourself when you were five years old that your mother thoughtlessly posted. You know, in a, you know it's a big change. You know, it's incremental enough that we don't see it as a radical change, but just the ability to reinvent yourself has changed quite a bit in the last even 10 years. And somewhat more ominously, we're increasingly just under a lot of surveillance everywhere. So it's not just the traditional online world, but there's a huge amount of permanent records about us. So at the same time that a lot of technology makes certain kinds of deception much easier, there's a whole other way in which deception itself is almost a endangered species. So to start talking about this, I want to go back to the 19th century and Charles Darwin. And one of my favorite Darwin quotes is, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. <laughs> and the reason that Darwin said this is he had um, come up with the theory of evolution, of survival of the fittest, and the peacock just seemed like, you know, this giant counterexample sitting there. Why would something evolve a tail like this? It, you know, it makes it you can't fly, you're very conspicuous. It, you know, it's sitting there saying, ha ha, not everything's about survival of the fittest. And it be, le was left as an open question for over a century in many ways. They, um, how it evolved, what he, after he wrote this letter, he was in the midst of writing you know, what would be his second big breakthrough, which was the idea of sexual selection, is that yes, it evolves via sexual selection, but that's a how it evolves. It doesn't really get at the selection question of like, why does it evolve? Like, why would females pick something that would be so detrimental to their offspring? And in the 1970s, an Israeli biologist named Amot Sahavi proposed what he called the handicap principle. And basically what he was saying was that um, there are costs that ensure honesty. And that in, that in order to say that you are the super fittest, you, have, you pay a cost because you can afford that, what he called a handicap. You can pay this cost to say, I'm much more fit. And the reason it makes it honest is something else that is not as fit as you are cannot afford those costs. And so in the case of the peacock, only the fittest ones can afford this extra handicap of both having this perfect display. It turns out female peacocks don't just look for big displays. They want the perfectly symmetrical ones. But, um, and so it, it's a separating function between levels of fitness. Um, his work languished for a while because he wasn't very rigorous in how he stated it. In the 1990s, it became um, another writer, Grafen. <laughs> Um, came out with a much more rigorous proof of it. And in the world of biology, it's now a fairly accepted um, theory. At the same time, there was another writer, Michael Spence, who, for a very similar theory, I think less well articulated in economics, got a Nobel Prize for it. Um, but anyway, this is just, this is also a, a, one of my favorite examples of it, and one that Zahavi writes about quite a bit, is that, um, and it's a very memorable one. So gazelles, a number of gazelles, when faced with certain types of predators, in particular coursing predators like dogs, um, instead of the fastest ones, instead of running away as fast as they can, they jump up and down in place. It's something called stotting, and that's a stotting gazelle. And from the perspective of signaling theory, this is an honest signal of speed because the ones who do this are the ones who actually can afford to waste that time. And it turns out that those predators don't run after them very often. They run after them occasionally, and it's enough so that by probing that way, a slower gazelle who was starting will actually get eaten because once the predator comes, the slower one doesn't have time to leave. But it's often enough that it's still kept honest enough that for most gazelles, they don't get chased if they do this. The dogs end up chasing the slower ones, and everyone except the slow gazelle is happier um, for this. And 
for the gazelle, it's, it's beneficial not only because not being chased means this is metabolically less costly than actually running. So they could do something that's less costly and it's also less dangerous to them. Apparently one of the problems with running full speed is not only that you exhaust yourself and then another predator might come and get you, but they often, they can break a leg falling. It turns out that running on those thin legs is actually rather dangerous. So this is a, a safer thing, but this way it keeps the slower ones from imitating it. Now, and you see this, you see various types of these costly signals with humans. And one of the things that Zahavi was very particular about, and which is a key insight into this, it is not just any cost that keeps a signal honest, but that it has to be in terms of the resource that you're signaling. So jumping up and down signals that you have a lot of essentially time to waste. It doesn't signal that you had some other quality. So for instance, in the human world, one of the things that people often <laughs> signal is wealth. It's a fairly obvious signal of human status. So having a expensive car is a costly and Except for, and one of the things that we will get to later is that in the human world, almost nothing is completely reliable. So we have rental cars, we have things that look like expensive cars, but they come from kits, we have, you can steal a car. So yes, we can fake anything. Um, and that's one of the interesting challenges. But for now, we'll just deal with honest signals. It is a signal of wealth. It's a, it, given that you actually bought the car, it's a reliable signal of wealth. But it is, for instance, not necessarily a reliable signal of are you a nice person? Or any of a number of other desirable qualities you might think you're trying, or are you super cool, or whatever, or are you, you know, sexually wonderful? You may think you're trying to signal that, and we use a lot of things like advertisements to try and add additional other signals in. It may be used to signal those things, but it's not a reliable signal of those. It's only a reliable signal in the domain in which it is costly. Um, but speaking of wealth, getting back to the online world, so one of the issues, one of the ways we can look at the development of signals within the virtual world is that, uh, you know, going back to the sort of early days of the net, one of the things that people really liked about it, cel celebrated, and for some others was very frustrating, was that a lot of these external signals of status are miss, we're missing online, in particular in the text-based <coughs> world. You, I mean, lots of people could get online, but if you were extremely wealthy, as long as you were able to have access to it, and again, that is still, to some extent, a signal of wealth, given you know world population, but within the population of people online, everybody looked the same in, in a sort of, in a text-based world, and so part of one of the ways you can look at the history of the net is to sh see how all of the different ways of signaling status within our external world have been brought back in. And so you can look at something like this is from, have you ever seen the Tumblr, Rich Kids of Instagram. Um, but that as we've moved into a increasingly visual and photographic online world, the ability to start bringing in additional signals from our everyday life is much stronger. It doesn't make sense if you can do it as a single one-off. A photograph is still a cheap signal. You can usually find a way of saying, okay, I've posted this picture of myself you know, in this desirable place looking like I have this fancy lifestyle. That's an easily cheatable one. But once you have something like Instagram, where you're dealing with hundreds of pictures of yourself, to be able to pull off, it's very, very difficult to create a completely fictional version of who you are. So if you're trying to display your external status, something like Instagram <coughs> becomes the site that allows you to do a effectively costly signal of that sort of status display. Um, next, I want to look at um, a different example of the types of things that humans signal about, in particular risk taking. and looking at this from the perspective of why it's so important to recognize that something is a signal. Because um, one of the issues with signaling behavior, and again, I can't get into all the details of signaling theory, but another basic piece to keep in mind is that as the receiver, as the audience, everything we look at in other people to try <coughs> make sense of them, we can call cues. Now some of those cues are signals, and some, the ones that aren't signals, we'll call evidence. 
And the distinction is that a signal is something that is intended for communication. Its purpose is to communicate. Whereas evidence are all this sort of cues that you may pick up about another person that were not intended for your use as a signal. So if you're a mosquito, the CO2 that somebody gives off is a wonderful cue to you that dinner is nearby, but we are not signaling to mosquitoes that we're here to be eaten. <laughs> but we give off CO2 <laughs> as a side effect of breathing. Um, and here is where it gets into a fairly nuanced side. If you are wearing a fur coat, again, that works as a signal of wealth, it can work as a signal of fashionableness and style, but to the person who is looks at it and says, you are a evil animal killer, that probably is not what you were signaling, though that might be a cue that they are reading. And so um, that's a piece of it. So here we look at, at taking risks as a signal. And one of, um, and also there's a lot of anthropologists have looked at signaling theory. And so it turns out that across all kinds of societies that there are lots of male coming of age rituals that have to do with taking risks. So this is um, one of them that's been written a lot about from the signaling perspective is Maasai, the traditional Maasai warriors would go on a lion hunt to demonstrate their willingness to take risk. Um, and here it's, you know, to, if you are agile <coughs> and fast, you will come home from this rite of patch, passage. And if you are not particularly agile and fast, taking a risk is something you probably should not have done and you may indeed not come home from this. Um, and a lot of work has been about what the reward of this is, is both certainly you, you have higher status in the community, but there is also when they go out and take a lot of risks in groups together, a lot of it is about bonding within the community. And so you see, you could look at something like drag racing from that same perspective. Um, but as a society, part of the issue around risk taking are what are the th risks that we think, wow, this is great, people are doing this and now we can see who, you know, who are the warriors of our society, who are, you know, the strongest and the bravest. And the other side are what are the risks we want to tell people not to take. And so when people are doing something risky, one of the things we tend to do is put up like surgeon general warnings. But the problem with that is if you're not looking at something from the perspective of a signal, you put up this warning, you think, well, that makes a lot of sense, practical warning, now everyone knows, and they're going to stop doing this. <laughs> but clearly, if you s recognize that the issue is a risk, and the point of doing it is to demonstrate how much risk you're willing to take, putting a warning like that is like catnip. It's basically saying, yes, the activity that you are engaged in is indeed something that you should be doing if what you want to show is how cool and brave that you are. And so part of it is from the signaling perspective and from the design perspective that looking at things in terms of signals is very helpful because it help makes you articulate what is the purpose of it and the underlying quality. And so as a designer, you can have a better understanding of whether you want to be promoting that or not, but it certainly gives you a great deal of clarity around things like not promoting the value of a signal that you're trying to ameliorate. Um, a second useful thing from the design perspective is recognizing signaling costs and not eliminating them. And that's, I think, one of the things that engineers tend to be extremely guilty of, is saying, you know, this is we're going to make X more efficient. And <coughs> by made, but the problem is, a lot of times when you make something more efficient, the cost that you're removing isn't a wasteful cost, but it's actually signaling cost. And that was, when, he, when Zahavi called this a handicap, and when Darwin was looking at that peacock, a lot of the things that you see as signaling and signaling cost, one of the things that stands out about them, whether it's drag racing, or having a giant tail or jumping up and down. They're all things that seem on the surface frivolous or wasteful or in some ways foolish. And that as an engineer, you immediately think, let me eradicate that problem. But if you eradicate these risks, you remove the communication from it. This is from, the design is actually from a project that some students of mine did several years ago 
um, where you, it was a social network where you did all these little infographics about your day instead of writing. But one that I wanted to point out here is this birthday one. Um, and so this was like in, I don't know, 2009, when Facebook had just started having t announcing to everyone when your birthday was. And she writes, how people found out about my birthday? Me? Facebook, another friend, their cal calendar actually remembered. And here again, it's like, well, it certainly has made it much, you know, it's a tiny example. It's made it much easier to know when people's birthdays are. And in fact, right now, you can, you know, easily get an app that not only will tell you when people's, well, Facebook will tell you when people's birthdays are, but you could actually get scripts that will send those birthday greetings out automatically to them. You know, and we'll even send physical cards if you want. You don't even have to intervene at all, which has completely removed it. Now, certainly in the past, um, for those who can't remember this, you know, it was very costly to send someone a, a birthday greeting because you had to learn what their birthday was. You had to be close enough friends to have them to tell you what it was. And you had to write it down, and then you had to remember to look it up, and all of those other pieces. So by the time someone said happy birthday to you unprompted, it actually had a particular meaning about their bond to them, which has been now effectively removed. Um, think about this, if you, because Christmas, once Halloween is over, Christmas is coming, and there's a, a sort of economic chestnut paper that returns almost every year called The Deadweight Loss of Christmas. And it's basically this economist, and he, now he's written a whole book about it, saying it's really horrible. He does whole analysis of looking at how often Christmas presents are returned, of the enormous loss to our economy of people buying presents for each other, and how much more valuable it would be if we send them gifts. And every year, some magazines <coughs> with a big spread about this, and why are we doing this like incredibly stupid thing, and how foolish people are, blah, 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 completely missing the point of what is the signaling value of, make, of taking that risk of buying somebody something that they had not asked for, of taking the risk of saying, I think I know what you want, or I think I know what I want you to want. Um, <laughs> but that there's the communicative aspect that's only valuable because you're risking being wrong um, about it. And now, um, to look at some of the problems that come up with signaling. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that makes human signaling so interesting is that we are ingenious. And um, I think one of the things that I found sort of most intriguing about looking more deeply into um, issues around signaling in humans is how much of human inventiveness comes from trying to cheat things. So just to give a quick example, there's sun tanning. And sun tanning itself as a signaling thing is, is very interesting because you know, it's about um, if it's, you know, it's been very stylish to be pale at times when if you were not wealthy, you were out in the fields. And as soon as the lower class jobs moved into factories, being tan became a more, a more expensive thing to be. And tanning became very, um, had a much higher social status to it. And so for quite a while, if you had a tan, particularly if you weren't in California, and you were someplace <laughs> like I am in Boston, and it's the middle of winter and you have a tan, uh, anyone could look at you and know that you had the, both the money and the time to have gone someplace much nicer and fairly expensive and all of those things. And so we invent the ability to fake tan or just even chemicals. So you, I mean, how fascinating, it's so fascinating when you start thinking about the amount of effort that has gone into being able to not, instead of actually going someplace pleasant, but to spend a lot of time in a rather unpleasant experience of lying in a tanning booth or slathering yourself in like orange goo um, in order to appear as if you had had a very nice time. Um, it's a fascinating thing about human, uh, human motivations. But in general, almost anything, if we sort of sit around in the reception and talk about like what is a reliable signal among humans, you will come up with a way in which people have found to cheat it. To, to be able to display it once it's valuable enough, to be able to display it in some ways that they can't. Um, dealing with college admissions, high school admissions, nursery school admissions is sort of a constant game of, it's an arms race between what you are looking for in the admissions process and someone who will take for payment a way of 
getting people up to speed who wouldn't have been able to do that get in before. So <coughs> in New York City, like you know, recently they've had to shut down this whole sort of nursery school admissions process because they were really trying to get like a whole <coughs> diverse student body, but whatever kind of tests they put in, in place, the very, very wealthy families would find some way of getting their child ultra prepared for it. So, you know, within two years they have to completely reinvent it, sort of always get that step ahead. Um, in the world of gaming, it's been interesting because, I, you know, there's a lot of games where you have to do something like grinding or, you know, which means basically to get to a higher level, just spend hours and hours and hours doing a fairly tedious task of killing monsters. And you do this for a very, very long period of time, and then you <coughs> kill a lot of monsters, and it takes a lot of work, but then you've reached this higher level. And that's a fairly good thing if you're playing these games. And then you get gold farming of people who, are, who will play these games over and over and over, and um, get to the higher levels, and then you can buy a higher level of game instead of <coughs> playing it. And so a lot of the piece here that's interesting, too, is um, the underlying economics of it. Julian DeBell has written about this, and Nicholas Yee has written some about this. Um, but, and there's a number of studies coming out about it. But it's also it's very interesting here to look at it again from that signaling perspective. Um, if you're trying to think about, well, how do we fix this from a game design perspective? because what that um, reveals is that when you look at what does being at a higher level in this game actually signal. So you reach level nine, and you did it by killing a lot of monsters that you killed. You didn't really need a lot of skill to do it. It just took a lot of time of doing this. And then you reach this higher level, but that in some way that higher level is supposed to represent having some kind of greater skill or greater camaraderie. So there's two questions from the design perspective. One is, you know, from the game owner's perspective, one, is it bad to be able to buy and sell these different levels? Maybe that's okay. If you didn't, if, have, if having the achievement of doing it through actually grinding through the levels doesn't really mean that you are a different type of person than the person buying it, then in terms of the gameplay, it shouldn't matter. But if it does mean something, then what does it mean? And I think one of the things, even if there's no skill involved, is it comes back to the issue of if you put in this time, you are more devoted to that game. So if you're running a guild within that game, you actually might want the people who have run through it, because they've already put in the hours to show, to prove how devoted they are, as opposed to the person who said, you know, I spent $100 and I got this, but now I'm in your guild and now I'm bored and I'm leaving. So part of it is, okay, if you see it as a signal of devotion, that's important. If you see it as a signal of skill, it's, it is a conventional one because you haven't actually gained the skill. And then that's a game design side that says maybe that sort of time of leveling up needs to be much more about skill building and then you couldn't buy and sell it. So if you look at it from that signaling perspective, it actually helps you look at different questions in terms of how you design things. Now, um, the next issue is in sanctions. And in the um, world of humans, where a lot of our signaling is not, either it's costly signals, as we've been talking about, but we're ingenious and we can cheat them, or a lot of our communication is conventional signaling, where it's not particularly costly, but what is able to keep that in, yeah, still honest enough to function is that we oftentimes have some kind of sanction on giving a signal falsely. Um, and there are examples of it. I just wanted to share this one with you because it's a charming experimental biology story. Um, there are examples in the animal world. This is a black-throated sparrow. And it turns out that high-status black-throated sparrows have really black throats. Low-status black-throated sparrows have white throats. And some experimenter thought, OK, well, that's not a costly signal because there's nothing about having that different color throat that really means you know, you're actually stronger. So it seems like it's, a, it's what they call a badge of status. And it's a conventional signal. So what happens you know, 
how do sparrows understand this? And the experiment he did was he painted a bunch of low status sparrows black <laughs> and set them loose. And they got attacked as effectively imposters. Because they're trying to get the same black paint. I think he put black paint on the on actual black throated ones and they did not have that same problem. Whereas the white throated ones that were black did and Part of it is that there's this sort of low-level sort of s probing, and it's the same sort of thing where we do when somebody's presentation just seems off. There's something about that sparrow that said, I'm not really such a tough sparrow, but had the badge that a tough sparrow should have. And when they were and in that role as imposters, they got attacked, and he did apparently remove them and clean them up, and <laughs> so he didn't just leave them <laughs> to be attacked. But yeah, so it was just a very interesting question around sanctioning. But for the most part, and I think this is where one of the ways in which human signaling, aside from language and many other things, greatly diverges, is that the type of sanctioning humans can do is not just the one-on-one. -on -one. We have reputation, we have notions of identity, et cetera. And that's where, again, the online world became very interesting because the, <coughs> all the kind of sanctioning. So first of all, again, let's look at um, sort of the early stages of the online world of a mostly text world. But you get this in sort of the not sort of Facebook-like spaces that still exist today, where you get online a lot of signaling is effectively conventional signaling. And the ability to do sanctioning is almost gone because you don't have clear identities of other people. There's not enough community to build up reputation. And so without, we're suddenly in the space where you don't have a lot of reputation, you don't have identity, and you have a great deal of conventional signaling is where a lot of attempts at communities have fallen apart because you really do get runaway um, deception. This is um, Land and Moon. The reason I just put it up, it was a very early online site. And so one of the earliest papers that was written about this, even though it was a phenomenon that was familiar to a lot of people, is called A Rape in Cyberspace by Julian DeBell. And where one of the things that was just kept surprising people, now it seems very obvious, but kept surprising people in the early days is if someone does something really egregious online, you say, OK, fine, we will evict you from our community. They'll just come back under another name. And they're the same person, and it will misbehave again under a new name. And so the whole notion of being able to have any kind of sanctioning was, is very, very, um, has the necessity of you have to have a persistent identity of some kind. And that identity, um, today, a great deal of that tends to be based on, for instance, once you had things like mobile phones, the rise of a huge amount of what tends to be called the sharing economy, but which is really a trust economy, was based on the idea that you could follow, you could have this very, very strong identity tied to an actual person that you could then build up these kind of reputations around them and, say, and try and sort of automate trust through that space. And so until you could do that, you had a much more flexible notion of identity. Um, the other way that I think is very interesting that online spaces have dealt with, um, that, or the phenomenon that you see online of how we st start to see emergent um, reliable signals online is in, the, is in the realm of knowledge. So for instance, again, going back when I we, you know, when we said like the most obvious example of sort of that type of costly signaling in the human world is in the face-to-face -face world is signaling wealth. And that's very hard to signal on, online natively, but the online world information is sort of our native currency. And so if you start thinking about how we signal in and out groups here in terms of knowledge, um, you start to see that that's a very, very pervasive part of the online world. If I show you this, how funny does that seem to you? Not terribly funny, right? But if you look at what had been some, it was part of a very popular internet meme about 10 years ago. Um, if you look at it in the context, okay, so invisible boombox, <laughs> then invisible bike, and then you go back and you see, then someone, you think of it, okay, someone posted this thing and it's Adam Smith invisible hand within the context of that joke about invisible X being a meme 
it becomes a joke. And so things like that, it's, you know, you can all come up with many, many examples of pieces like that. A lot of them are very humor or meme based, but even the rate of change of slang online, of how people use words, of what, of how phrases move around, changes very, very rapidly. And so in, um, in the whole realm of what is fashion writ large, so there's fashions in clothing, but there's, there's fashions in management styles, there's fashions in the art world, there's fashions in academics. Pretty much anything where you can say that there's a signal that in some way denotes your status in a particular subculture, but the form of that signal changes over time, whereas the, what the underlying meaning doesn't, and how you know what that new form is is your way of demonstrating some kind of insider status within that community, and um, is what I'm calling a fashion signal. And I think that's it's one of the most important things that you see online. And some of what you see that's interesting too is the mistakes that people make with it. Um, again, this is an older example, but this is Second Life. And I think the corporate embrace of Second Life, for instance, was a very interesting and kind of public example of a fashion fail, of being a fashion victim. That there were a lot of companies that said, you know, back in 1990 something or other, somebody said, you know, you should have a website and you should, you know, have a URL for your company. And they were like, no, it's ridiculous. We don't need that. And then they had to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars two years later buying their domain name back from the clever hacker, you know, not hacker, but like the clever person who said, you know, I will buy up, you know, x.com and y.com. Then they realized it. For instance, MIT had to, they didn't buy it. They eventually made them give it back. But there was a student body group that had www.mit.edu. And for quite a, for a couple of years, MIT was web.mit.edu because www.mit.mit.edu was held hostage by their own students. Um, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But, yeah, so then, all, so then Second Life came out, and then all those same companies thought, we won't get fooled again. <laughs> We, we are going to be out there, we're going to have a presence, and we're going to have our own island. And so there, I think particularly the ones whose job it was to be consulting on the future of technology, this was one of those examples of saying, okay, now we're going to go out there and we're going to take that risk. And it was a case where they should have been able to analyze and Again, I think if they had been looking at this from a signaling perspective, they would have been able to say, well, lots and lots of places where you can, pre outside of the game world, where it makes sense in a different way, but for day-to-day -day conversation, places where you have lots of easily, easy abilities to create um, highly masked identities probably are not going to be the strongest corporate presence, but they didn't recognize that. So they got to have that kind of public fashion, fashion fail. So the final um, sort of example I want to talk about here um, is signaling sentience and the choice to be deceived. And I think it's one of the most interesting sort of design and research questions that we're dealing with right now, which is, you know, there's all kinds of things you have to signal. And one of the things that we've gotten very used to signaling is right now, you know, you go to lots of websites and you have to be able to signal that you are a human and not a robot. And this is another case, it's a little arms race between saying what are the abilities of you know, different AI programs now and what can we do that's a quick test. You know, so it's a perfect signaling example. You want something where, the where it's not too onerous to do, but that gives you that separating function, in this case, between a human intelligence and an artificial intelligence. Um, this is um, Ashley Madison. Um, so for those, of, how many of you are not familiar with Ashley Madison? So if you, okay. So it's a, it's a good story. For, even if you've heard it, it's such a fun one. Um, so Ashley Madison was a, da a special dating site. Uh, it was a dating site for people who wanted to go online mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. married people who are, wanted to have affairs. And the idea was that both men and women who are interested on in cheating on those spou their spouses could meet up on Ashley Madison. And so it was up for a while. It had a lot of people signed up for it. 
And then, as happens, they got hacked and their entire database got stolen. So first of all, you had a lot of really panic-stricken people who were like, oh my god, I've been like hooking up with these women, blah, blah, blah. And now you know, there was this fear that they were going to get blackmailed. And then a second, much more interesting scandal broke, which was it turned out that there were a lot of men on Ashley Madison, but there, weren't, and there were almost no women had ever signed up for it. So who had all these men been chatting with? But that the women on Ashley Madison were agents, were software agents, that all, like, all the women that these people had been talking to didn't exist. That they'd been, and they'd been chatting with them, they had been conversing with them, blah, blah, blah. They'd had lots and lots of long interactions, but they'd been totally fooled by these robots. And it turned out that the, then the, the third thing came out, which was that the way that Ashley Madison was really making money was that w if they really wanted to meet these women, then they would get sent to an escort service. And there was a woman pretending to be the software agent that they had been talking to. So oh, it's a great <laughs> story. But, um, <laughs> but it's, a, it's like a really interesting case of how if you are motivated enough, you, if you're really motivated to be deceived, almost anything can deceive you. Um, but, that's, but it's a particularly interesting one you know, for this perspective of we are living in a world where, you know, if we're going to dating sites, now we have to be careful that the people we are talking to are actually not software agents, now that you know that these like clever dating scripts are, are out there somewhere. Um, and <coughs> there's you know, an increasing number of things like Echo and Siri that our homes are starting to be filled with social robots of, of different types. So this is a transcript from Eliza. Um, and Eliza was written by a MIT computer science professor in 1964. Um, and this is something I just chatted with it you know, recently. So it's st there's still versions of it up and alive. It was written in response to Alan Turing's paper of 1950 that was a, called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which was still sort of the sort of foundation paper of artificial intelligence. And it's in that paper that um, you know, he makes the prediction that where he says, he makes this very interesting elision, and, and that's where the Turing test comes from. Where he says, if you, can, if you can't tell after a certain amount of conversation, and he gives different ways that it can be done, that something is a human or a machine, we will have to say that machines are intelligent. It's a very complicated paper, and there's still a lot of controversy about whether he actually thought they would be intelligent. He did say he thought the question would be meaningless. Um, I think for reading it many, many times, he really believed that machines could be intelligent, but it would be years of training. But and what's important about that is that he thought that the machine that could converse with you would have to have been, as he described it, brought up from childhood, like from little computer um, to big one. But that it, would, it would be a learning machine that you talk to and you train for years and years and years so that there actually was some sense that there was an underlying sentience to it. Um, the, so the point that Weizenbaum was trying to make when he wrote Eliza was he, he wanted to make the point that by having shifted this problem of what is intelligence to essentially the signaling problem, where the Turing test basically says that language, and in fact a very limited version of language, namely the ability to answer questions and to fool an observer into thinking you are human is a signal of intelligence, which is a much bigger, complicated, but hidden quality, and that this is a good signal for it. And so what Weizenbaum is saying is, no, it's not. And so he said, look, I've just written the sentence parser, and he framed it as a psychologist who was just going to ask your questions back at you. And he said, look, but it, it really feels like you're conversing with something, but here's the source code. It's not very complicated. And he thought this would make the problem go away, that people would be like, OK, you're right. You're right. Language is not the right way to do it. What happened instead, people were like, I need a psychologist. <laughs> I need to talk to someone right now. His own secretary would lock herself in the room and say, go away. I'm talking to the psychiatrist, and I need privacy. People started talking about how this would be the future of therapy, et cetera. And he became so disillusioned and dismayed. He, was a, um, he had come to America from, as a refugee from Nazi Germany. And he was just 
horrified by this because he felt that this response was the path to really, to basically to having such a lack of respect for the human mind and empathy and the difference between talking to a human and talking to a machine that, you know, it was sort of the way into fascism for America and the world. So he didn't do any programming and spent the rest of his life basically writing about the dangers of computation. So I think thinking about the problems he was thinking about and when do we care whether the other we are dealing with is a machine or when indeed do we care about what the other is thinking at all are enormous questions to deal with. And I just want to give you a couple of sort of things to play around with as you're thinking about it. One is something like the Tamagotchi. Now, again, this is a little keychain pet. It's another example of how we, one, when something reacts to us and behaves in an unexpected way, we tend to think of it as sentient, we tend to think of it as another being. Now, we, if you're a kid with this keychain pet, and you go to your grandmother's house at dinner. Now, for those who didn't know, the, one of the things, the hallmarks of the Tamagotchi were um, you had to, it was this little keychain pet, you had to feed it, you had to clean it, you did all those things by just pushing a button. So it's really, really simple. But if you didn't do those things, it would die, right? And that was it. Also, it's interesting because the Japanese ones actually died, and you'd have to go and get a new one. The American ones would come back to life because we only deal in sort of Disney-like happy endings. But it would, you know, <laughs> die for a while, at least. So you go to your grandmother's house, and you have this thing, and you're, instead of talking to your grandmother, you're fussing with your Tamagotchi. Now, are you doing, now, for, as a parental, as a parent, do you think, wow, I think this is really bad, this is disrespectful, this is an actual real human being at the table across from her, you, she should be like paying attention to people here, um, put that thing away, I don't care if it dies, or are you saying this is an important training ground for empathy, that by demonstrating your responsibility, you, if you're responsible enough to keep this thing alive, maybe yes, you are responsible enough to have that kitten that you want. Whereas if you were willing to put it away, or I tell you to put it away and let it die, that's starting to teach you to harden yourself against the needs of others, even if the needs of those others are, are robots. So here we have something like the Paro dog. This is a, another Japanese cute robot, but now they're furrier. But, um, <laughs> So this one, it's a seal, but it makes little seal-like noises, and it will hug you and do all kinds of things. But it's now being marketed as a pet for elderly people in homes. And here it's this interesting kind of question about for what population does this seem like a brilliant idea, and when is it horrific? Is it, because if you think, um, we have another, I think it's a different company, but has a kitten that, that's very similar. And that's being marketed to people who live in homes that are too small, can't have a real cat, but this way you can have a pet cat. Is it horrific to give your child a robot cat instead of a real cat to lavish affection on? On the other hand, even if you think that's an awful idea and there's something kind of creepy about like getting your child to fall in love with something that's pretending to be alive, if you're dealing with a, an Alzheimer's ward where it's actually calming the patients, it, like what is what what does what makes that difference there in that sort of movement of affection from machine um, to not machine? Um, and here, I just want to we're sort of out of time. Um, here's an example of you know a contemporary social robot. Um, this is actually being built by Cynthia Brazil at the Media Lab. But one of the things you can see from here is that it's a robot that, if you look at sort of, if you look at, for instance, any Disney movie, <coughs> or you know, any time you're trying to design something that says, "Fall in love with me," um, there's a, a woman named Leslie Zeverwitz at Brandeis who did a, has done a lot of work about our misapprehension of character through faces. But her original work was on what she called the baby face phenomenon, which is if somebody has features that are like a baby, which are a small chin, a little nose, a large forehead, large eyes, um, 
we tend to think of them as having characteristics of babies, that you want to take care of them, that they're trustworthy, they are not out to harm you. They may not be the brightest ever, but they're, kind, they're needy and you want to care for them. They're kind, they're warm, they're all kinds of things like that. So when you look at a robot like this, it's designed completely to take you off guard um, uh, for anything it may do. And so I think what a lot of what's interesting in looking at a lot of um, designs today is the question of how is this changing the science of persuasion? Um, you see this in the Hello Barbie doll that I think got somewhat taken off the market after people were particularly alarmed about some of the elements of how it was spying on you. But if you are looking at um, what are the ways that people can it, that people establish trust with each other. A lot of it is through a f a signals that can be very difficult to give dishonestly about how trustworthy you are, but it turns out that you can build a lot of imitations of those signals into a machine, and that we're increasingly surrounding ourselves by, whether it's software agents that can converse mellifluously and persuasively with us, or something like a Amazon Echo in a house that can not only, I mean, that's not the cutest ever, but in, is going to be able to have its in, intonation. Have you ever noticed how hard it can be, for instance, not to sound annoyed when someone is really irritating you? <coughs> but here you'll have this machine in the house that never gets annoyed, no matter how many times you ask it something. But if it suggests that you buy this you know, excellent new product and you say, no, thank you, and it sounds a little disappointed. <laughs> you know, are you going to be more persuaded? And so the last thing I want to leave you with is this quote. Ginny said Mr. Weasley from Harry Potter flabbergasted. This is after all kinds of horrible things happened to her because she confided in an intelligent diary. Um, Haven't I taught you anything? What have I always told you? Never trust anything that can think for itself if you cannot see where it keeps its brain. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions. And when you ask your question, please do it loudly so we can all hear. Oh, actually, I guess I shouldn't turn that off yet. Yes? Um, could you explain the Barbie? Because I've never actually seen that before. Okay, so um, the Hello Barbie was a Barbie doll that would people, the kids could talk to it, and it would then record what they were speaking. It wasn't actually intelligent in itself, but um, it was meant to be a prototype for what would subsequently be intelligent Barbies. But it would actually send some of the dialogue back to a central server, and that would send it the answer back. And so it was both, one is the issue of it, it's talking to it, but then the other part is the central co connect collection of all of a child's confidences in a, doll, in a doll being sent to Mattel. And then Mattel tried to make the parents more at ease about it and said, but we'll share with you what it has told us in com your, the doll in confidence, which made it even worse. So that was a quick issue. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I could help thinking that uh, I'm reminded of the Plato's uh, Republic, the cave, cave example, <laughs> the allegory of the cave, yes. where the uh, prisoner was chained and they had to look at the shadows and uh, interpret reality. So there is uh, some sort of uh, analogy here. Technology becomes the shadow and we have to interpret the reality through the technology. And there's a very powerful allegorical kind of a story here. Right, or I mean, and part of it is also is saying that our relationship with others, to some extent, is always very cave-like. That the underlying reality of another person is always hidden, to some extent, and what we are dealing with are our shadows through that. The technology adds an additional layer to that, and it changes the shape of the shadows and the types of, of the shadows that we see. So part of it is understanding to what extent it distorts them or adds them or what are the effects on it. Because in some cases, as I was saying with the surveillance 
It may make them less shadow-like, and it may give us a clearer picture for better or worse, and sometimes it can make it less clear, but how to recognize those and know which one we want is the point. Um, thank you for a really fascinating talk. I had never heard of signaling theory before, um, so that's, that's really cool, and I really appreciated the design implications that you included. Um, I'm trying to make sense of the signaling theory, so I'm, I'm wanting a little bit more input. Um, can you articulate a relationship between signaling theory and maybe just a classical understanding of semiotics? Mm -hmm. Like sign equals signifiers. Right. They seem to be they're, talking yes. about the same thing. Is the signaling theory, does it have like, economics baked into it? Like, yes, I, so I sig okay. a little bit more. There is an economics built into it, and so the similarity between semiotics and signaling theory is both of them are looking at, and there's elements of semiotics I think help signaling theory. So in semiotics, um, and uh, there's different versions of it, so I'm going to look at the Saucerian one where you have a sign is really a pair of things. There's the signifier is what's perceivable. And then there's the signified, which is what is the underlying meaning of it. So, and in semiotics, they're particularly interested in what in signaling theory we consider conventional signals, where the two are tied together only by convention. The fact that, and there they're interested in how those change over time. So for instance, there's a certain color that in English we call red, that would be the signifier. I won't get it, then it can get really complicated. We'll just call it a patch of red, is that, and the meaning is that color, but in French it's rouge, etc. But they don't get at all into this issue of honesty and deception. They're interested in just how that these things are tied. The difference with signaling theory um, is that, and they also have this notion of code, that to understand each other you have to have a code, and so, a lot of what they're interested in is the idea that with shared codes, you have the same pairings. Signaling theory doesn't really deal with the notion of code, which it actually needs. So part of what I write about is how you bring those together. You do need this notion of codes, but what signaling theory is, is particularly interested in is what is the actual connection between the perceivable signal and the underlying meaning. And so they're more interested in things where something about the form of the signal is based on the meaning in such a way that it makes it harder or easier to produce the signal depending on what it's, whether you have the thing that you're meaning to convey. And so it, that's how it deals with that question of honesty that way, but in terms of the actual signal, it's about the, the tie and the relationship between the things. We have time for one more. Okay. Thanks, this was really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious about kind of where you ended up with, with the idea of sort of the, you know, what, when our devices are lying to us. Mm -hmm. And what I'm thinking about is all of the people who are basically professional liars. Mm -hmm. um, in the way that you mean, or deceivers. Mm -hmm. um, salespeople, you know, the real estate agent, the car salesman, the psychologist in some ways, who <laughs> this is professional for right. them yes. to do the same work. Is there a difference when we put that capability into a machine than when we pay a person to be that deceiver? <laughs> um, I th what I'm trying to do with that question, it's like such a good question, is I think signaling theory, which many people have never heard of, I think is a very, very useful <coughs> approach to think up through that question. And I think it's a really, really hard question. Um, so I think part of it is we also need to answer it from the human perspective. So in the book that I'm working on, I talk about the machines and then from there go back to that question about humans. Cause, and like an everyday example is like waitresses. Some of you probably worked in, you know, as waiters or waitresses. But you also go to a restaurant, you don't particularly want to hear what that person really thinks of you. You know, like <laughs> tables of five middle aged ladies, I hate them. <laughs> they don't ever tip well. You know, hi, well, like, that's a brilliant choice, the Pollock today. You know, that's what you want to hear. So a lot of our jobs really are in that service side of, of what you're calling sort of professional deception. Um, 
from the sales and advertising side, you know, it's a whole side of saying we're effectively in the business of putting deceptive meanings into objects, of selling that expensive car, not by saying, wow, this car will make you look rich, but by saying, this car will make you look incredibly sexy. It, it, you know, it, it has nothing to do with that. That's in the ad. Um, and so I think it is philosophically a really interesting way of looking at what that value is because, as I said, I didn't have the time in 45 minutes to go through the whole theory. So we talked about the cost to the signaler, but there's a lot of issues around what are the costs to the recipient of discerning whether this is true or false. And so this last part about the willingness to be deceived is also when are the times when we say, you know, we actually want to be deceived and it, are we making particularly good judgments about that? So, you know, I think it's, it's more of saying this is a really interesting framework for uh, helping to very clearly, cleanly think about those issues. On that happy note, let's give everybody <laughs> a <laughs>